Welcome to the Vermont House Appropriations Committee. It is Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. I think Valentine's Day. And uh, we um, had a briefing this morning on security. And right now we're running a little bit late. So I appreciate Commissioner's patience. But we're going to have with us now the Department of Taxes and go over their budget presentation for FY24. Commissioner, I don't think you were with us during budget adjustment. So would you, I'm gonna ask us to introduce ourselves because we're all kind of somewhat new. I remember you from my last time around in here. In yeah, sure. Texas. And, um, I'm Representative Diane Laffer and I represent Addison 3 and live in Virginia. Representative Robin Chai, good to see you. <laughs> Pat Brennan, Esther. Tiff Bloomley from Burlington. Harry Dolan from Wastefield, and I represent Dexter Great Faced in Moortown, Waitsfield, and Warren. Good to see you. I'm Mark Mahali from Callis, Plainfield, and Marshfield. Uh, Trevor Squirrel, Underhill, and Jericho. <laughs> Woody Page, mm -hmm. Port. Rebecca Holcomb, Sharon Stratford, Norwich, and Thetford. Good morning, Jim Harrison, Chittenden, Menden, Killington, and Pittsfield. He's getting so good, I might remember all your town <laughs> time coming up. <laughs> Representative uh, Tolino. Tolino is at a meeting, and but he'll be back, Brattleboro. And then Representative Lynn Dickinson is at the end there, and she is from St. Albans. Not there right now, but she'll be coming in. Um, this taxes budget belongs to Representative Shy, so um, I'm sure you, you work with her before. <laughs> Who we know well, yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> Commissioner, for the record, and, and we'd like to introduce yourself and your team. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, Commissioner uh, Craig Bolio, um, I'm here with uh, our Chief Operating Officer, Andrew Stein, who's here remotely, as well as our uh, Finance Director, Sharon Acey, and then also Will Anderson from uh, the Department of Finance and Management is here with us. Uh, and all of those folks are instrumental <clears throat> in putting this budget together, and they have my, my utmost thanks. Uh, what a better way to start a day about celebrating love than the tax department, right? Everybody's favorite agency. Well, in this committee, we like it. This is perfect. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to just start uh, speaking a few minutes about our mission, values, and goals as a department, and then I'm going to hand it over to Andrew to really get into the meat and potatoes of the budget and the ups and downs. Um, I, are, are we driving the slides? Question I should have asked before. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, you have the slides. Oh, perfect. Okay. We have them in our, yes. That's perfect then. So I'm just going to start on the first slide that uh, says uh, the mission and goals. And actually, maybe where I'll, I should start really on the second uh, page, if you want to flip to the page that has uh, the four core values. But our, our mission is a, a simple but important one. It's to serve Vermonters by administering our tax laws fairly and efficiently to help taxpayers understand and comply with their state tax obligations. The part that I really like to focus on are those first three words, right? To serve Vermonters. Uh, and there's a variety of ways that we do that. In 2021, we actually established core values. So it was a relatively recent exercise for us. Um, although we had had a mission statement for a long time, to my knowledge, the department hadn't established core values before. And we thought really at that point in 2021, coming up on two years of emergency management from the pandemic, that uh, we ought to have a shared language or a North Star uh, to help guide and ground our decision making moving forward and help shape the agency that we wanted to be. And we established four of them. Uh, the first is service. Um, maybe the one that was most uh, organically and vigorously uh, practiced during the pandemic when my office did a lot of stuff that we didn't do, as, as many agencies and businesses around the state and the country did. Um, but really one that I was proud of our staff every day. They came in, put their heads down and said, point me in the direction of helping somebody and I'll do it. Um, when we talk about tax administration, right? If people don't understand what their liabilities are, they're less likely to file and they're less likely to file accurately. Right? For better or worse, the bedrock of the US tax system is voluntary reporting, right? People report to us what they owe. They report to us what they paid. Uh, we examine it, maybe we adjust it. We send a refund or a bill, right? But we don't go get every dollar. People come to us with that. Um, furthermore, you know, and, and they've had academic studies that back this up. In those cases where people do not understand their liabilities, if you take that service-oriented approach, it has a measurable difference 
on the voluntary compliance rate and the voluntary reporting rate. One of the most mind-blowing stats from my department is 98% of the money, more than 98% of the money that my department collects comes in voluntarily. That means that we stand up the systems and we produce the forms, we produce the instructions, and we stand by to help when people need it. But 98% comes in voluntarily, right? And that doesn't mean that our compliance division isn't doing their job. They bring in over $50 million a year, and they've brought in more money year over year, every year for approaching the last decade, save for 2020, uh, when COVID hit and we repurposed folks. Our second, oh. So just a quick question on the $50 million. Sure. Um, can you categorize that as to, I mean, some, some people make honest mistakes. Yeah and they need to be corrected. That's right. Some people are intentionally trying to um, skirt the system. That's right. Chucks, I got caught, so I got to pay. Um, any, if you had to uh, estimate buckets you could put that in? I don't, I don't want to estimate a number, but I can say the vast, vast, vast majority is honest mistakes. On what? The, the vast majority is honest mistakes, Okay. not outright fraud. Now, we have some, right? And we catch it every year. Um, but most people, they, they just don't know what the right thing is to do. Uh, and so it's an honest mistake. There's also an element, and, and we'll talk a little later in the presentation, which is the tax gap, right? And that is also comprised of more honest mistakes and those folks who are trying to skirt the rules and, and not complying. Um, and, and that's a little ambiguous as to how big that is. But yeah, I would say the majority is mistakes. Thank you. Did you have a question? I'm just going to leave it on the table. I mean, it's just, it, I'm going to leave it on the table. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second core value is integrity, right? As we just talked about, the bedrock of the U.S. tax system is voluntary reporting, right? So we need to be signaling both the, to the people who want to do the right thing, that we do the right thing, but also signal to the people who aren't going to do the right thing, that we do the right thing, right? And there's a few ways that we go about that. The first is that we... Uh, take uh, to the maximum degree our responsibilities for confidentiality and security. We strive to make sure that at all levels of the agency, we're collecting the proper amount of tax and not just uh, revenue maximization. And we've got to have a culture that uh, holds ourselves accountable, right? That uh, people feel comfortable admitting mistakes and that we can correct them. And that also, uh, if somebody sees something wrong, they can tell us and know that we'll take action on that. The third is growth, and that's not necessarily growth of revenue, but uh, hopefully you do see that over time. But it's really growth about the way that we provide value to Vermonters, right? And certainly with the pandemic, uh, we saw how much in the world and society was changing. There's a lot of elements of that in tax administration too, right? You've got cryptocurrency, you've got the gig economy, you've got remote work, you've got other stuff I'm not even thinking of, right? All this stuff impacts taxes, impacts tax administration, and our department has to remain at the forefront of that to be able to serve Vermonters and make sure that we're uh, doing our duty uh, to the state and to our taxpayers. And that means that our staff have to feel like they're, they're empowered and have a future at the agency, right? Part of that mission. Um, it, it's why uh, organizational health, uh, employee engagement and staff morale are, are such high priorities for me. Yep, go ahead. I really appreciate your, your working on this. And one of the things, and you see this at the federal level as well, and one of the challenges about talking about noncompliance is that there is um, the, there are so many opportunities that are within the law for people to avoid paying taxes. And I just, and it feels like our tax agencies are barely able to keep up with that and make recommendations on how to address that. And I wonder if you're seeing that as well. So if you're very wealthy, you don't have to pay taxes. So, I mean, there's a, a bigger question that you're asking there. I mean, what, I think what you might be referencing is probably a lot of the internal revenue. Um, and so the challenge that any state agency or state would feel when they decouple from that, and we feel this particularly in Vermont, is the challenge that becomes for compliance if you start to decouple from the feds. So if you're concerned about certain areas of the internal revenue code, maybe having certain taxpayers not paying their fair share, um, Vermont could decouple from those. And there are areas that we do that. Um, for example, Vermont doesn't uh, recognize uh, uh, accelerated depreciation schedules. Um, we have our own rules for certain net operating losses as well. Um, in a small state like Vermont, that gets challenging quickly, right? Because 
We rely today so much on the federal infrastructure for audits. We get what's called federal tax information and that brings in millions of dollars a year where the IRS has done audits. And if we've got the same rules as them, we can piggyback that. If we don't have the same rules as them, it's, it's kind of all on us to find it. So it's, it's a decision for the legislature in areas to decouple from federal tax law. But I do urge caution and thoughtfulness when we do that uh, to make sure that we'll have the resources at the state level to go after that. Right. And does, it, that does that get to the... Yeah, and it probably also affects carried assets. It affects past business pass-throughs. And I just wonder if you feel like you have the capacity to track that stuff. Um, we do not have the... We have the capacity to, to do what we're doing tied up to the federal law. If, if the discussion started to be, let's start decoupling from a lot of the federal laws, then we would have capacity issues for sure. Sure. You don't have to answer this now. Uh, cybersecurity, and I know you've got a great new um, system. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on, tech, on time, on budget, and paying for it's a great, great result right there. But I know that the cybersecurity has been a real issue, and you, your department would be one sure. that would be a prime place to tap mm -hmm. into. And then um, a few years ago, which I'm sure hasn't gone away, but the rash of false tax claims that came in that ended up being problematic somebody filing on somebody's behalf and then when they go to file later somebody yes. has absconded with their refund yes it's let me let me can i i'll hit both of those separately yeah um so to start with cybersecurity, i mean i think for any revenue agency that's like top of mind concern priority Right. Uh, we work with our partners in the Agency of Digital Services who handle a lot of those kind of cybersecurity issues. They are handled directly from my department. But as you mentioned, we do have an awesome computer system, uh, VTAX, that we continue to invest in to make sure that we have all the latest security updates. And it's when Andrew starts to talk about what's in our ups and downs, you'll, you'll get some information. Part of what we're asking for this year is to continue to make <clears throat> those investments. Um, so I think we're in good shape, but nobody's ever perfect, right? And we've always got to be vigilant about that. The second issue of um, identity theft refund fraud. So, yeah, that was, I would say, probably peaked approaching about a decade ago, right? And there was an interesting point where um, criminals were able to start getting that information where state agencies were catching up to getting that information, right? And so that created this real information mismatch where a criminal would have the info and it would look legitimate enough that the IRS and state agencies had struggled to catch it. I am happy to say that in the last several years, and particularly with things like VTAX, our access to data is much greater than it's ever been. Um, and we've actually seen a downward trend overall in Vermont in identity theft, refund fraud. And I. I I'm hopeful that there's two elements going into that. The first is, is what I just mentioned of having everybody's got more data. It's harder to do this now. For criminals to get it through, they have to have even more data than they, than they would have ever had before. And unfortunately, there are other financial crimes that I think have become more attractive uh, in, in those years. Thankfully for us as tax administrators, that means a downward trend. The second piece is we've been really vigilant about this in Vermont for the whole time where the IRS and other states have struggled with it. We have worked really, really hard in Vermont to have like virtually zero dollars of fraud issue. And so I, I can't say this for sure, but I'm hopeful that folks who are inclined to commit these crimes look at Vermont and say, that's not a place that is worth, is worth doing it. Um, and that is hopefully paying dividends for us as well. But thankful to say it's always gonna be a problem, I think, but definitely on the downward trend and, and limited exposure these days. Thank you, Representative Bloomley. Hi. Um, so a few years ago, um, the Department of Labor sent out <clears throat> um, yeah, 1099s. Yeah, the yeah. 1099s, and a number of my constituents were affected by that. And um, the now identity theft insurance that the state provided for the last two years um, is expiring. And I'm just wondering how vulnerable. <clears throat> are those folks to identity theft at, at this stage in the game? Um, I don't know that I can answer that. I mean, there's, there were so many people involved and the actions that those individuals may have taken might protect them as well if you freeze your credit and things like that. I will say, I mean, we, there are data breaches all the time, right? Um, and we are 
constantly trying to watch out for those, keep ourselves abreast of when they're happening so that we can flag our own systems, right? And um, one of the more insidious scams these days is trying to hack CPA firms, right? So that they can get all the client information. Um, and when those kind of things happen, we try to figure out, you know, who was involved, who was impacted. We will have data on that from the Department of Labor issue, right? Because we know who were, mm -hmm. issued all those 1099s. I would also say, um, you know, no, normally when we see these kind of crimes, it's not it's not homegrown. It's not local. It's you know, identity theft fraud is not usually being committed by Vermonters on Vermonters. It's usually, in fact, people out out of the country um, because it's harder to catch them, right? So, um, in terms of of you know whether or not somebody got something in a Vermont mailbox, there's there's certainly a risk, but I would say it's lower than than if. For instance, uh, you know, like a data breach happened where somebody outside of the country had access to database. Mm -hmm. um, does, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Uh, again, I, I think for a variety of reasons, people should always be vigilant and taking steps to protect their own identity. And but, but at our department, that's one of the things that we try to be mindful of is being aware of those kind of things and how can we make sure on our side that we're trying to catch that if people are filing when they shouldn't be. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and then the last, uh, the last core value I have is community. And that's, in many ways, that's the value that all the other values flow into, right? I mean, I think maybe us and the DMV have the broadest constituency in uh, Vermont state government and that we interact with virtually all Vermonters, right? And they come from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different cultures, different languages. We've got to be ready to, to serve them all. And recognizing how community plays a role in tax administration, right? When we have people who are calling us for their renter credit and really need that money, right? Those are friends, family, and neighbors. When a business that we frequent is collecting sales tax on behalf of the state, right? To just be mindful about the external community that we have, but also the internal community that we have at tax, right? And caring about organizational health and employee engagement and morale. We're gonna feel better and we're gonna do our jobs better, right? If we're supporting each other at the department, working together and being willing to ask for and receive help. And that really feeds into our three goals. Um, Actually, oh, just one thing. I, I do remember when you talked about these values last year in this appropriation, um, we were hearing from every department and agency, and I think we still are this year, about how you know high the vacancy rates are. Um, and I seem to recall that your vacancy rate was really quite low in comparison with other agencies. Is that still the case this year? Yeah, I think it's about 5%. Um, and I can say we have, we are fully staffed as of this month in every division except one. So, and that includes our taxpayer services division and our finance division, both of which are integral with uh, the tax processing season. So we're feeling pretty good right now. I mean, we've put a lot of focus on this. There was a period where certainly when the pandemic first started, we started seeing a lot of applicants, people looking for that stability and, and, and uh, of state government. And then we got to the point where I think everybody got where those were starting to dwindle and we were starting to struggle a little bit. And we put a lot of focus on it, right? About selling ourselves as a department, about selling the work that we do of being meaningful and valuable. Um, we have an awesome recruitment video on our website for people who haven't seen it. It's really well done talking to like frontline staff about what they like working for the department. And all of that has paid dividends, really a lot of of like frontline staff putting in time to, to be messengers to, to potential applicants. So happy to say we, we are feeling pretty good going on. Kudos to you guys because you really took the initiative and created a community that's not just the people at the top putting in the so. Yeah. Um, and we have really three overarching goals and then I'll, I'll wrap and hand it over to Andrew. But the first is to be a model for service oriented tax administration, right? And what that means is, um, I want to be recognized for the service levels that we're providing. Every agency says they're service oriented, right? But it's it's uh, it's not the same. I I once called the regular helpline of a bunch of tax departments around the country. About a quarter of them hung up on me. This was like the phone number to get help, and they were like, "We're sorry, we have too many calls. Please call back." <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? If you called my department right now, I think that the wait time would be maybe zero, certainly under five minutes. Um, been unable to get through to a person. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just to say it. And we should talk because that that is that's 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 not what we're going for, and it's not the experience I hear about. So let's let's talk, and we can fix that. Um, the second is to reduce the tax gap. Right? We talked about that a little earlier in the presentation. So the tax gap is the difference between what should have been reported and paid and what actually was. 
Um, we, it's really hard to estimate. And so to my knowledge, the state has never done it, but the IRS does it every few years. And it's always really backdated. So their latest, I think, is for 2016 and 2017. The IRS estimates that after all of their own compliance efforts, the federal tax gap is about 13 or 14 cents on the dollar. So every dollar of federal taxes that should be paid, the IRS thinks they're getting between 86 and 87 cents right, which translates to half a trillion dollars or close to it, I think. So it's a big number, right? If you, if, and, and there are reasons they have federal payroll taxes that we don't have, we have sales taxes that they don't have. So it, it's unclear to me if that's what the state tax gap would be. But if you just translated that to the state general fund, you're talking several hundred million dollars, right? So that's foundationally the reason for uh, really any tax department exist is to um, engage with those folks. Again, most of them just making honest mistakes and helping them get into the voluntary compliance system, but also empowering our audit and compliance division to find and engage with those who will not comply voluntarily and helping them get onto the right side of the law. And the third is uh, maybe the most subjective, uh, maybe the hardest, but I want the tax department to be the best place to work in Vermont state government. Taxes are hard, taxes are complicated, taxes can be scary for folks. Um, we need a talented and engaged workforce to be able to meet our mission and serve those Vermonters. Um, I want people to enjoy the work that they're doing, to enjoy coming into work. They'll do a better job and we'll all feel better and be happier about it. Um, if you, I have 150 staff. If you asked all of them what it meant to be the best place to work, you might get 150 answers and that's okay, right? Um, we, we have to be able to uh, strive for that even if it's subjective and even if it means different things to different people. Carrie? Or Representative Jones. Thank you, and good morning. I, I just want to um, express my great appreciation for the services that you have provided Vermonters. I know firsthand I have constituents who reached out to you with complicated questions that their own accountants can figure out, and you personally responded to them in a very uh, quick turnaround. And uh, that kind of service is, I think, it, emblematic of the your department and the type of work that you're doing for Vermonters every day. So I wanted to just express my appreciation. Uh, thank you very much for that feedback. And I'm, I'm happy to pass it along to our staff when we get those kind of compliments. I mean, I think this is one of the benefits and ways of being a small state and a small department, right? Is, um, you know, I, I came up through the department. I started as a temporary employee, right? And I've had really the luxury of working in a number of different positions. So I, I know different areas of the department. I know what those jobs are like. And, and many of those folks I knew I knew as peers before I took this job, right? Um, and so I know everybody's working really, really hard. We want to be accessible. We want to be helpful. Um, so I appreciate that feedback and uh, happy to pass it along. You also have very complicated terrain to explain. So really, I'm sorry, say that again. it's also what you have to explain is very complicated. So I really It can be. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It's not, easy. it's not an easy job. So I want to make sure you've got 20 minutes to get into your budget and any new new initiatives. Yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew to uh, work through the ups and downs and uh, the initiatives. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Right. We've had a couple of blips on our end. So if uh, we encounter those, Craig, I'll kick it to you and then I can jump back on. Got so it. Andrew Stein, Chief Operating Officer, Department of Taxes. I know many of you, but not all of you. Wish I could be there in person, but getting over an illness. So I'll spare you all the germs on this wonderful Valentine's Day. Thank you. <laughs> so when I'm going to start on page six, uh, which shows our total expenses for the year in a pie chart, $30.8 million. The biggest- It is something that we noticed, or just sorry to interrupt, we, there's no page numbers. Whoops. Oh, so, yeah. It happened to a lot of the presentations yeah, this year. Yeah. Okay. All right. To be in green at the bottom, they're on my version that I sent along in the PDF. They're, I don't know what they are. They're right here in the middle, they're just in black. Oh, oh there we visible. go. Yeah. But I, I, for some reason, it looks like there is a formatting issue on the one page that I want to start on, which is page six. So it's just after the core values with the pie chart there. Yeah, and we're we're trained in in to go right straight for the crosswalk. So it's the one side just above the crosswalk. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this this year, biggest piece of the pie, as is typical for us, are salaries and benefits. The piece that we'll talk about, spend a bit of time talking about here is our IT piece, which has grown 
um, from past years in terms of our operating budget request. It's not actually growing in terms of our expenditures, but we're folding in our computer modernization fund into the annual budgeting process or proposing to do that, which we'll spend a bit of time on in a moment. I wanna just touch on our current initiatives, what our current budget is supporting. We're implementing a range of new policies, the Act 138 tax reforms. That's a big package that passed last year, new child tax credit, changes to the earned income tax credit, changes to the child independent care tax credit, changes to retirement income exclusions, student loan interest deduction. There's some other reforms that occurred there too. And that took a lot of time uh, in testing from our team to update our system and then to help taxpayers navigate those reforms. So that's a really, really big deal. I mean, our personal income tax accounts for 60% of the general fund, and it has by far the largest impact on Vermonters in terms of the, the number of filers that we have, 380,000 filers. It, it's really a massive effort every year to administer this tax, um, though we're glad to do it. So corporate income tax reforms, we're also in the process of implementing a range of corporate income tax reforms that the legislature passed last year. Cannabis taxes, we implemented this past year, and that's an ongoing implementation, helping new businesses. There's a lot of, there's a lot of folks who have never run a business who are navigating a new market here and there's a lot of service that goes into that and then there's a range of new local option tax towns and helping businesses understand how to navigate the local option tax we want to maintain a historically high processing efficiency this tax season which we'll talk about in, the, in a little bit if we get to that slide but you can look under our performance measures for personal income tax administration last year we set the loftiest refund processing goal that we've ever set as a department and we hit it. We also finished processing homestead declarations for property tax credits a week in advance of the deadline last year, which is by far the fastest that we've ever turned that around. Um, and there, were, there was a lot that went into that. We made a lot of changes to be able to accomplish that. And we're very proud as an organization to have those impacts on our communities. We want to complete the Vermont Property Information Exchange, and more than one, we need to. This is the implementation of the new statewide property tax IT system. It's on budget and on schedule right now. We uh, are in the final phases of implementing that project. We're planning to move forward with a new scanning project. Another, another item here is building on our recruitment success, and I should also mention we want to build on our retention success as well it's important to invest internally as, as, as well as externally on building our workforce. And we have a really, really strong team that we're very proud of. We're going to continue process improvements on forms and VTAX updates that we've been working on. And we're planning to further operationalize our organizational values. We're incorporating those in our merit policies and in other areas of our performance evaluation process. So I'm jumping to the next slide here, the ups and downs, which is meat of this you know salaries benefits and retirement those are up internal service fees are up the biggest up here is 5.2 million dollars for the tax computer system modernization fund and we'll jump into that a little more on the next slide but this is a fund that has existed since 2007 and expenditures have been greater than this in the past for this fund but this fund has never existed within the annual budget cycle, and that's something that we're proposing to change here. This is a fund that used to receive multi-year appropriations. So that's why you're seeing this as an up here, because you, it typically doesn't come before this committee in this format. Also on here is an $800,000 up for the, it says the State Appraisal and Litigation Assistance Program. We're calling it internally the Commercial Appraisal and Litigation Assistance Program. And I'll touch on that on the next slide. So and then we have Andrew, let me let me start. Let me the the special fund. You have yeah. the five point two and the eight hundred thousand is coming from a spe the special fund. What's the name of that special fund? So those are two different funds. Two different. Those okay. Are, those are two different funds. So okay. the five point two million is the tax computer system modernization fund, and that's a fund that has existed since two thousand seven. Yeah. That's and, the, yeah, that's the savings went to pay and then you kept a percentage yeah. into yes, so exactly. that you could, okay. Yes. So yeah. that's, that's part of, maybe we should just go to the next slide because that gets and into then, 
of our. But program. the eight hundred thousand is commercial appraisal and litigation assistance program. So yep. what that would come out of is local option tax processing fees. There's a special fund for local option tax processing fees. And the as the number of local option tax towns have it has increased over the past number of years, so have those fees. And while our administrative burden is higher than it was even three, four years ago for administering these taxes, it's not as high as the revenues generated from these fees. And this is something we've been transparent about over the years. And so this is a proposal to use that the surplus and fees to cover a need that municipalities have been um, expressing to the department and to the state for a long time now. Okay. Representative Harrison has a question. Yeah, I just want to go back to the 5.2 million. Is that an ongoing, that increase an ongoing expense each year or is this a one-time It's It's ongoing. It's, 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 it's ongoing. So it's about five million a year, depending on the year. So that fund has and continues to pay for our VTAX system, our integrated IT system. We never received a separate. We, we have a little bit of general fund that we pay that we use to pay for that. But to build this system, we uh, have used the computer modernization fund and we use the computer modernization fund to support that system. So in terms of implementing new tax types, in terms of security enhancements, that is paid for from this fund. The Vermont Property Information Exchange, the new property tax system for the state, is paid for from this fund. The micro simulation model that the Joint Fiscal Office and the administration share to model uh, economic and personal income tax changes is paid for from this fund. The scanning project that is underway and that we're planning to move forward this next year is also paid for by this fund. And well, so- one, one important oh. piece there, Rep. Harrison, that might be helpful. So th this money, it looks like new spend, mm -hmm. but it isn't. This has been getting spent. It's just been getting spent through session law and multi-year appropriations. Okay. So what we're looking for is, is That's very helpful because I'm putting it into the whatever you've been spending and then a five million dollar increase. Right. Right. So it's right. It's not. It's not a five million dollar increase. It's what we've been spending. There is a, a restructuring of the fund that is a, a bit of a general fund hit because the fund has been deficit spending for a number of years by design. But yeah, so that's why it looks scarier than it actually is. But the challenge, and one of the reasons we're proposing this is increased transparency, right? If you were to try to go back and piece this fund together, you're looking through session law year after year with amendments and restructurings and things like that. So our, our proposal here in part is to say, let's just make this part of the annual budgeting cycle which will show up on these. Thank, thank you for the clarification. Sure. So yeah, I'll just thank you, Greg. When I read, read, when VTAX was started, it was yeah. like, if we, correct me if I've got that, I'm going to just be very simple. We want to purchase X system. X system should create savings within the process. Yeah. Okay. So literally move to the new system in segments, but the savings that were created from the, the system purchase and running were then fed back in to pay for it. So at the and then in the end, we had a little, there's excess and you, and the V tax used to give the general fund because that savings was a nice boost. That's right. So and, I, yeah, go ahead. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Manager. The one thing I would, I would clarify there, it's, it was not like internal savings. It was increased revenues that got Incre brought. Okay. Yeah. So essentially we had, again, more data, better processes right. than we've ever had. So our, our audit and compliance division was able to bring in more money. I would say it was so successful we actually got the amount of money we needed early and paid it early and got a discount. Um, and you'll, you may remember that over the last several years, we've had a couple of restructurings that have been designed to bring the revenues going into the fund down because we did hit a point where the big part of VTAX was paid, the $28 million upfront investment, but the fund structure was still generating the money to pay for that. And we were like, whoa, 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 bump the brakes, right? We don't need that much. Um, a few years ago, it got restructured again to be 2% of compliance revenue, which remember from earlier in the presentation is 2%. So it was 2% of 2%. 
Um, and that was intended to spend down the surplus that had been created by the fact that we had that, that uh, discon I don't want to call it a disconnect. But, you know, yeah, exactly. Basically. Before we had restructured it, the fund was running such a surplus. And so now we think that this restructuring, which does increase the revenues going to the fund a bit, will, will be sustainable for the long term. So what's, how much is in the fund now? Is there zero or is there... Is it that 2% of 2%? And Andrew, should, Andrew, you've got that, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. give me a second. It's, 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 what we're, what we're projecting, projecting is around the end of this year, year, year around 5, 5, 5 million in the fund. In the fund. But Keeping in mind that we spend if, about 5 million a year. If, if you give me if a second, second the, the issue is, is we project, project that, that, that. So, so high level, high level issue, the issue is in FY24. If we, if don't, we adjust don't adjust the funding, the funding structure, structure, we'll have spent we'll down, down the money, money fund because, because we've been spending, spending down this big surplus since, since I think it was that point in the that we went back. Yeah. You, can you can see, see the, the, if, if, if I show you a chart, you walk through this, the revenues, the revenues were, like were like this and the expenditures were like this. We build up the surplus in the fund. Once that changed, we we then have the expenditures up here and the revenues here and we've been spent down. So at the end of that point, 24, we we, we will we just about just spend out, spend out or, or have spent out before the, the end of FY24 or all, all, the, all, all the money in that fund. So it's about $5 million, million what we're projecting at project the end of this, this year, year heading into FY24. So years. the ongoing $5 million or so will come from this fund to take care of the ongoing. That's right. Right. That's but what, it's going to be right. calculated differently than they have been doing it. Yeah, that's right. So that you've got that amount within that. Yes. Okay. The, the other key element to this is the fund is set to sunset at the end of this fiscal year. So we, that, that's another part of our proposal is it's to just language. codify it. Yeah, it's and it's all it's all there in the language. But yeah, there's also a restructuring that moves it away from compliance revenue specifically. So instead of 2% of compliance revenue, we're asking for 0.21% of all revenue collected. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One is, as I talked about, we, we strongly encourage voluntary compliance, even within the compliance division. And so I didn't want to have odd incentives for maybe the department to be taking overly aggressive actions for our budget. Um, and so that, that, and it also, you know, as we get further away from VTAX implementation, right, VTAX changed everything at the department, not just the compliance division. So it is a, re, it is a restructuring in that way as well. So, um, go ahead. And we had talked about this before, but we will need language for for the Europe initiatives to put in the budget. So I, I think it's in there. It's in, is, in it, the, is it is it in the, the governor's budget? It's in the governor's budget. budget. It is the language that we want is in there. Are you sure. okay with the language the way it is? So we'll just check with Maria yep. to make sure it's the way we like it too. Okay. Sure. So that goes to so you're codifying what was in session law to make it statute. Yep. And so and paying for it with one of pay taxes. Yep. And then is there some other piece of what you were doing within that? Can well, you it's the it? bringing it into the annual budgeting cycle. Instead of multi-year appropriations, do it one year at a time. Yeah, okay. It also makes more sense as we're in the operational phases of these projects, right? It was useful to have multi-year appropriations when we're in implementation and who knows when we've got to pay the invoice, but now it's much more cyclical. Great, thank you. Sure. And, and, and the, the, the third, so, so we've talked about the computer modernization fund, we've talked about commercial appraisal and mitigation assistance program, which I'll just touch on that a little bit more. That was passed last year, 32 BSA section 5513. It was supported by both the administration and the legislature. And what this really, the aim the here is to improve the integrity of, of the, appraisal the appraisal system with regard to commercial properties. properties. So when so we're talking, talking about our education funding, funding system, system, and particularly on the property tax, tax side, it's a closed loop system. system. So that means, so that, means that municipalities don't, don't have the money to value certain properties. properties. They're, they're typically the most the complex and highest value properties in the state to value. That then shifts. It, it, it creates, creates a risk of shifting a tax burden on other taxpayers. taxpayers. And so and what so this what will this do is it'll create, create two positions, positions, a program a manager, manager, as well as, well as an, attorney an attorney position, position, position which is technically, technically through the AGO's office, 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 we pay for it. For it. Uh, and uh, that position will help with appeals and litigation. And $500,000 in 
in, in money to pay for commercial appraisers to assist municipalities with these large contracts by commercial appraisers. So that's that proposal, and that that proposal would be an ongoing spend. Any questions, Any questions on that, on that before I get to the last, the last main initiative? This, this isn't one time. This is would, would be half a million a year. Eight eight hundred thousand a year ongoing. Eight hundred thousand. And this was this was interesting. This program was created with a contingent effective date, contingent on July one of this coming year, if the legislature funds it. So the legislature had asked us to come back with a cost estimate, which we've submitted to Ways and Means and Senate Finance. But this is that cost estimate to run the program. And this would, to be clear, this is dipping our toe in the water, right? We think that the scope of this would be 10 to 15 properties a year. So this is not the state able to assist on all commercial appraisal for, for 800,000 a year. But this is to stand up the program, see what it's like, see what the, the benefits are and the challenges and, and help out municipalities that need it. So, so this could be like when Green Mountain College closed or something and it's, a, it's how do you appraise it for, it's not a college anymore? Or, yeah, I mean, the, right. The examples like that are, are what we're thinking about. And, you know, towns that may not have the resources, but get, you know, some kind of big new thing or a mall or a dam. Well, we have a program for the dams, but um, the one that I keep thinking about is a, a, a methane digester at, right in Salisbury, right? Where, the, you know, who knows how to handle that? Um, so it would allow the state to be able to help to help with that. And then the, and last, the, last, the last, last last initiative, initiative is a one-time one initiative, yeah. and that and is to use uh, current, current use surplus, surplus to make a one-time one appropriation to modernize the program. program. And I have, I have a description on this on slide, slide as well, but roughly 43% of the land area, area is, is enrolled in the current, the current use program. program. However, However, this, this program, program is highly reliant on paper. All of the all records, records for this program, program are in are paper. In they're in a the vault, but they're in, in paper. paper. And, and to digitize, digitize all of the records, records and, and further digitize, digitize and, and streamline a range, range of, processes, of processes, specifically the application, application side, side and, then and then moving forward, forward transfers, withdrawals, withdrawals uh, of properties, uh, properties in that system. system. We're proposing uh, a one-time one tax benefit program, program of 1.75 million. million. And at its heart, we're going to incorporate this program in the tax system. It wasn't initially incorporated in that system because it's part of the property tax system. And the state of Vermont does not administer or collect property taxes. And we don't administer property taxes through the B-tax system. But over time, we identified opportunities to incorporate this specific program into the B-tax system. And there's a range of checks and verifications that can be automated. And they have a talented team in space that they really struggle to keep up with the, the demand man program when it's when you have this amount of paper and this the extent of manual processes involved here it's almost impossible to keep up with so this is our this is not our best performing program and if you go to slide let's see here if you go to slide 12 of our presentation you'll see that i mean the number of applications processed by april 15th is 20 percent the average day is the process applications and this doesn't fall fully on the team but the number of days to process an application is about 150 days and that is really out of line with the number of other programs we want to see major measurements here so i was just going to say so committee i just wanted to look because i wasn't sure that i had seen the 1.75 but for those that are keeping score it's on page nine in the language. It's under the fiscal 24 one-time special fund appropriations. So this 1.75 is coming from the current use administration fund, which from notes when we had a walkthrough, I have that it has about $2 million balance in it. Yeah. If, and, and so there's a request here that that's where it's coming from. So it's not a one-time general fund. It's a one-time from this special fund to make this upgrade, right? Yeah, and, that, and that special okay. fund is for current use administration, right? I mean, certainly the legislature could change that, but that, that's, that's what it made sense to us. <laughs> I want to make sure that I saw where it was and what. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. So it's in there. 
Representative um, uh, Holcomb. When you do these modernizations of the systems, do you also look at how we collect information oh, yeah. like that? Oh yeah, to, it's to streamline the whole process. I mean, in many, I I had some experience on the VTEX project. I was a business analyst there and then the project director for a couple of years. Um, in many cases, we're rebuilding processes almost from the ground up. Right? It's like a fresh look, capacity planning, make sure it works for the, for what we're going to be able to do. Um, the benefit that we'll have doing this one that we didn't necessarily have with VTAX is we have all the experience with VTAX, right? When you first when we first built VTAX, we got a bunch of improvements, but then yeah. later we also realized, oh my God, I didn't realize I could do this, right? And we built it out. Now we have more of that, but yes, that's part business and process improvement, huge part of the process. It's, it's a lost opportunity if we don't do that, frankly. Yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm just going to wrap up. The last, the last slide I want to spotlight is number nine for the current administration. And again, this again, is the largest tax, 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 we administer 30 plus tax types. So there's, but there's no tax tax that impacts the more than the personal income tax. And that impacts the general fund more than the personal income tax. And our erroneous refunds prevented the county in 2020 last year or up. Our time to file refunds issued within 45 days of due date was up to 95%, which is the lobbyist school we've ever set. And, that's, and that's, that, that is really impacts, impacts on, on, on a on range, range of working for monitors and, and, um, and, our and our community. So we're very so proud of that. that. And then refunds issued within 30 days of filing that percentage way up as well. well. So, so it was without it was a doubt the, doubt the most successful, successful tax season we've ever had. We also stood up a new render credit, as I mentioned before, for process from the back direction was time. Okay. Somebody must have just put the bells by mistake oh, or something. No, no, no. Okay. So one, I have one. Okay, go ahead and then we'll start wrapping up. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, oh, we talked earlier with the budget adjustment. I called you and said, gee, we're getting, you're, we're reverting a lot, you know, millions of dollars for the renter rebate and the homeowner rebate. And we yep. agreed that it was probably because of federal subsidies and other things that took the place of it. Yep. And so what's happening this year for this budget? Are you trying to assume something back to normal or are you, did you change your numbers as a result of what happened? So the homeowner rebate is, is forecasted each year. Um, and so that, I don't remember what that's tweaked to this year, but yeah, we always calibrate that. The renter credit is not necessarily calibrated every year, but we did not propose any adjustments to that. That's been at 9.5 million for a number of years. When we first did the reform in 2020, I think, one of the, one of the hopes was that we would spend that 9.5 million, right? Because the program spend had been going down year after year. And now we've had the couple weird years with the federal subsidies impacting it. So our, our stance was, let's not touch it right now. Let's see what happens and then adjust the dials to the program to get that 9.5 spend, if the legislature agrees that that's the right number, of course. But from our chair, it was more of, let's let's see what it looks like this year and then dial dial the, okay. or change so the dials to spend. Year when, when all the dust is cleared. Yeah, and I mean, you know, not all the dust is cleared, right? But um, hopefully we're getting a clearer picture. And, and, and the homeowner rebate, homeowner rebate is a consensus forecast between JMO and Oh, it is. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep, sorry, good clarity. <laughs> If, are you also, I mean, what's the, um, is there a timeline on the homeowner rebate and the property tax credits? I'm, I'm asking because some of our towns are now talking about delaying collection of taxes in August until those are fully done, but it's also now creating problems for the school districts that have to mm -hmm. receive those revenues in advance of the school year so they can fund. So it feels like something has happened, which is changing local perception of when those rebates will be calculated and people will be informed. A, a few years ago, we had, we missed the deadline several years ago. And so that might, might be reverberations there. But for the last couple of years, I mean, we've, we've hit that deadline. Again, last year we hit it a week early, which is what? usually we're down to the last, it's June 30th. But what I would say is that is a big squeeze for everybody. Right, June 30th is the deadline for those files. We get them to towns. A lot of towns want to bill on, you know, July 5th, right? And so they need their tax rates and they need their property tax credit files. So it can also be a real squeeze if 
the town hasn't voted its budget yet, right? Because the state gets, I believe, 30 days from that. So sometimes there are towns that have delayed that as well. And then we're trying to get everything done at the 11th hour. Um, so it can, be, it can be a challenge for the towns that want to bill first thing in July. But I, I will say for the last couple of years, I believe we've had our house in order at the department to be able to do that. So I'm yeah. curious. I'd be curious to talk with some of those communities about where that perception is coming from. But I do yeah. acknowledge, since I think it was three or four years ago at this point, we had missed it for not everybody, but a portion of them, and we sent a second file. Then I remember OK, yeah, so it must have been 2019 or earlier. The memory may have both beyond. Yeah, yes. right. So I, I'm not saying it's you. I'm just trying to figure out where and there. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah, no, yeah no. and I mean, again, even in the best of times, even in the best of times, it's a tight, it's a tight window. Stuff happens. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, anything else you guys want to tell us in committee? Any other questions for the tax department? Thank you. Oh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for Thank all you. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I'll be in touch. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, as I need air traffic control. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll follow up. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll email you. I want to get that sorted out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sarah's ready. And then he's got to go, but Sarah's. Sarah's ready. Maybe we okay. can do it before that. Yeah, because we got a break at 11, right? Okay. Are we comfortable? Good morning. Welcome back to the Vermont House Appropriations Committee. It is Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. A little bit after 10. We're coming back in. We're going to hear from our JFO, uh, Sarah Clark. There's a couple of things that I've asked Sarah, which we may not, obviously we're not gonna fit all of this in here, but just so you have it on your radar screen. One of the things first off that she's gonna show us is that, that um, as a committee, I mean, you may have looked at it online. This is the letter that when we send to agencies, both the House Appropriations and the Senate Appropriation, well-negotiated letter that uh, uh, goes to an agency that says, hey, when you're coming in, this is what we expect to bring, and we expect you that this is what we're, information we're going to want to know. I thought maybe we should walk through the letter. So mm -hmm. when you're working with your budgets, you will see what we've sent out as the expectation for what they should bring. That's this letter. Mm -hmm. And then I just want to, there's also probably, I don't think we're going to have time, coming up like next week is to understand what the cash fund is. I think Adam might be coming in around around that and then JFO to help us. Also, the letters that have now gone to all our standing committees in the House are out there. So you may get um, questions about what does this mean or where it is so Sarah can help us navigate. And all of the letters to every one of the committees is on our web page mm -hmm. that you can see what was sent to them on, on our behalf, see what their, their questions may come from. We also have not walked through the balance of the language, which sometime maybe before we leave here this week, we could have your presence. So those are things that are on my radar screen that I would want Sarah to navigate. All right, but first up, great. tell us about what is here. Great, good morning, everyone. So you should all have in front of you a letter to Secretary Kristen Clauser, the Secretary of Administration from Senator Jane Kitchell and Representative Diane Lanfair, the chairs of the Appropriations Committees. Also to note, as the chair indicated, it's helpful on the House Appropriations Committee website on the homepage, there's a link to this document on the left-hand side. So it's anchored there, it's always there, it's underneath additional information and it's labeled budget instructions. So. I think this is one of those core foundational documents for this committee that it has this kind of permanent place um, on your appropriations homepage. And speaking um, as a former employee of the executive branch, this document was key in helping me to prepare and understand what were the critical components of information that the appropriations committees were going to need in order to be able to evaluate our budget proposals. I'm being summoned. Okay. So, um, Representative Shai, will you take over? All right. The bus. Thank you. All right. Shall we turn? Okay. Great. So, I think um, why don't we just do a walkthrough starting on page one? We can talk a little bit about some of the components. For some of the members, this will be not new information. Um, it may be new for some of you, even returning members. Um, 
and it's good context as you, you know, you're kind of, I'd say maybe midway through hearing from the agencies and departments as a good kind of refresher for the types of things that we should be seeing. Um, sometimes they don't, they aren't able to during testimony get into some of the details that we're asking for, but there should be documents um, that would support that if there's an area that you want to drill into. So new since the pandemic started is that we've added a section to these instructions asking agencies and departments to, to use the COVID-19 pandemic as a lens to talk about how they've had to change the administration of some of their programs because of COVID-19. Hopefully that the impact of COVID-19 is getting less and less in terms of like normal operations, but we felt it was still important this year to include you know, that question because I think it's still, you know, its presence is still being felt across state government. And so specifically as it relates to COVID-19, uh, this language asks agencies and departments to um, provide uh, information about how, what challenges and opportunities have been presented as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and if they've had to change the way that they operate in terms of the delivery of services, the use of space, technology, et cetera. In addition, this calls out in the bulleted section what new, new initiatives are being proposed in the budget. I think in general agencies and departments have been doing a great job really highlighting what those initiatives are um, for you to evaluate. And it also asks what programs would you run differently? programs you'd stop operating, but I don't think we've heard a lot of those yet. <laughs> no, no, but um, <laughs> we don't tend to stop. Yes, <laughs> it tends to be more challenging, but I think uh, Diva may have one proposal in their budget that they talk to you about that they're proposing to stop, but there aren't a lot of them. <laughs> um, no, as is typical, we ask for documents to be provided to this committee in PDF format. I'll note it, it's interesting the like ebb and flow of paper over time. Um, I think there was a time before the pandemic where we were, House Appropriations was really using your iPads for just about everything and there were very few paper documents. I think that tide has turned in some ways, maybe because of the pandemic and just the way that we've had to meet and look at things. So now I think we kind of rely on paper and electronic copies. So. I'm going to page two, which talks about evidence-based performance accountability. Um, so this continues to be a focus of the legislature um, and the executive branch. This um, whole page is really dedicated to um, talking about the importance of evidence-based performance accountability and information being presented in a way um, that provide some data to help evaluate the performance of programs. You'll see the three questions that are highlighted kind of in the middle of the page that will be familiar to folks. So we did have some, I think, helpful additions in this section this year. So the questions are, how much did we do? And the primary measures that departments or agencies are using to assess that performance. That second sentence, I think, is a new addition this year, trying to really drill into getting the data to assess the answers to the questions, how much did we do? The second question, how well did we do it? And what are the primary measures to measure that? And number three, is anyone better off in the primary measures you use to assess performance? And I think as you look back on the testimonies you've received over the last two weeks, you, we have been able to get into some of these more performance accountability conversations. Uh, I think it's a, a forever a, an evolution um, and striving to improve um, in the executive branch, speaking from my own experience. The uh, chief performance officer within the agency of administration, they are required to submit to the legislature what's something that's called the program performance management budget, the PBMB. Um, and last year, I think they ended up because because of COVID, right? They ended up, I think that report was filed with the legislature in mid-March and we did, this committee did receive some testimony from the chief performance officer. Um, I don't believe that we've received that report yet for this year, which also makes sense in the context of the other duties that office has had to take on. We have a question. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you for walking through this. This is yeah. helpful. I, I've seen the letter, I've read it, mm -hmm. so that, but this is always helpful as a review. I do, my question is about those three questions. 
in terms of whether that's enough. Because you could say, like, just take vacancy savings, where we see uh, where we're unfortunately in a situation where some agencies are uh, have greater percentage of vacancy savings than what we typically try to strive for. So, if you ask these three questions, how much should we do? It, it's a function of of current staff capacity. It doesn't get at the question of uh, and and then how well we did is again, a function of current state capacity. It doesn't look at um, where we've fallen short and why. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanna flag that in terms of whether is it, there will be an opportunity sometime in the future to, you know, in a future year perhaps, mm -hmm. to kind of revisit these three questions and whether um, it's adequate enough in terms of helping us ascertain um, the, the, the extent to which we are uh, delivering customer service services for the public at, m at most effective manner possible. So I think that Tristan has a response to that, and then we have to. Yep. And I have to run, and I apologize. I have to leave in just a second. Um, and uh, really appreciate it. I think that to your point, Carrie, the there's another paragraph down below that if they are doing it. <laughs> will really help get at the deeper story and the deeper information around all of the things that I've been sort of say asking for um, the external benchmarks, etc. And then also, especially the trend over time. So if they answer the question, how much should we do in a vacuum, but without the trend, and we let that happen, but we don't ask for the trend line, then we're allowing that number to be used in a way that isn't useful. And that, that's my thought for us, and I apologize for running right away after I say this, but I think the degree to which this will become a more important leverage rests in our hands, not the administration's hands, because we have to ask, we have to show that it matters to us. We have to probe here and push and have follow-ups and have that keep being built. They have done a lot of work, but it, it, if, it, if we don't show an interest in it, um, then that is just performative work. It's not applicable to the day-to-day. -day. Well, and the other thing in this particular case with, with vacancy savings is they may do it really well, but they may be letting things fall away that they can't do. So they're not doing enough of it because if they have more so, so things aren't getting done. We don't have a what isn't getting done. Right question right the yeah trend will help a little bit but actually it doesn't necessarily and, and that's our i think that's the art of our work as as appropriators is to surface that so so, so, right. sorry, so i'm so grateful to you for saying that and one of the challenges are there are two challenges i'm seeing one is that um one is as my statistics professor used to say you can't fix with analysis what you messed up with by design we don't even have the data like they're not even collecting some of the data sometimes that we would actually need to evaluate the impact so part of it is how can we think forward now to what data we need them to collect as we implement new initiatives so they actually can be evaluated because i don't even know if we can evaluate some of them so I, I suspect that's true and i think we have to look at that when we put appropriations together Right? Yeah. Like if we're saying that we're going to fund something new, and then I'm going to get out of this. This is the baseline data you need to collect. Otherwise, it's not analyzable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, I know you have to run tip and then run. Yeah, I, well, <clears throat> I, I was going to say some of what Tristan said, and I really, really appreciate that point. And I, and I you know, I, I also am really interested in what is the benchmark you're shooting for? You know, like what is, and we got that from the Department of Taxes, I yes. felt, you know, like yes. they, they identified they what are we shooting for? They do a good job. And some, for some departments, it's easier. You know, it, it, it's quantifiable in ways that um, uh, is harder for others. But I, I, that, and I, so I think that that contextualize your performance in this program area is a really important line. It is something that, um, I even missed when I was reading this. <laughs> so just some word that like we can just keep our eye on that piece. Yeah. Thanks. Does this letter get sent to you? Um, you know, that is a great question. I'm not 
I would Maria know? Uh, yeah. I go to you. I don't think it does. Or Bees or the How about the state, state colleges? colleges? Yeah, I don't think it does. Uh, it goes to state agencies, departments, and agencies. In fact, sometimes we have to send it. We should make sure we've sent it to the um, that's, uh, attorney general and general. But you know, you make a good point because we're, you know we might millions of dollars to the state colleges and the University of Vermont, and they come and present. So um, yeah, I feel like in the future we might want to do that because if we're going to try to fulfill our role with those entities which hopefully I am doing, but nonetheless, it would be nice if they got. But this is a public document, and I don't know that there isn't any reason that you couldn't say, you're in my portfolio, we've asked everybody else to do it, here's, here's what we'll be asking you, so here's the letter. Well, I'm meeting with the lobbyist <laughs> for universities in an hour and a half, and I will give it to her. Okay. And I don't want to put Aaron on the spot, but I'm about to, and we can follow up. I think, you know, we send it to Secretary Clouser, and I know they 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 sent it out across state government. I'm not sure about the entities that you asked about, but I think the intention when we schedule is that we also include a copy of this information. Um, and so they may have received it in that way, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. So we it is important that they all receive it. Um, gets it twice, he gets Yeah, he can, yeah. He can tell Mark if he did. I wonder if also for next year, we should consider a fourth question, which is of all the policy alternatives you, you've considered, is this the most effective and efficient way to achieve the stated goal? Because we can be very efficient, but if it's not within a particular <laughs> strategy, but if it's not the most effective and efficient strategy, we aren't even looking at that. How do you decide on the one that you picked? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Um, so anyway, as it relates, I have last year's um, report from the administration, which is, I, I got the acronym wrong. It's Programmatic and Performance Measure Budget Report, PBMB. Um, it may be something that the committee, once we receive that report, you may wanna have the chief um, performance officer in to have this kind of conversation with him. Um, his name is Justin Kenny, and he's been kind of at this um, for a long time. And so it's, it, last year, it was a very interesting conversation to follow. So maybe something to put on the radar for this committee. Okay, I'm gonna to flip to the next page, which I realize there's not page numbers, so we can add that for next year as well. So, um, so the top of the page I'm at is the appendix, which is where we list out the documentation for the budget testimony um, and kind of related items to make sure that um, the administration is aware of. One, as you should be familiar, um, the first section talks about how there is a point person on the Committee of Appropriations that's kind of delegated responsibilities for oversight and review of, you know, a certain cadre of departments that you are responsible for. And so this just talks about that process for the administration and lets them know that you will be reaching out to have budget meetings. And I know that that's been happening all over the place, both for budget adjustment and for 24. But this talks about the process and the, you know, lays the foundation for the back and forth that happens as this committee works to understand the budget proposals. Um, and it also highlights, which I think is really important, especially in the House, is that the point person from House Appropriations is going to work with the committees of jurisdiction to understand the budget proposals. Um, and so I think that's part of what we do in the House to craft what eventually will be the FY24 budget is the Appropriations Committee working collaboratively with the committees of jurisdiction to evaluate proposals. The next section labeled budget testimony just talks about how the commissioner or director of each department will come in and, and provide brief, concise testimony that leaves times for questions and discussion. Um, and it <laughs> notes that the testimony and supporting material materials should reflect the FY24 governor's recommended budget. Um, it also talks about the use of iPads which I, looking around the table, there's iPads, there's computers, including myself. So we have a mix of electronics that we use here. The next item- Actually, you say relate to the governor's budget, which is better than yes. reflect. So if someone wants to come in and has the guts to 
to, to come in with a, an additional request, they can. I'm not sure that I've ever seen that happen, but uh, <laughs> yes, that is in the realm of possibility, I guess. Well, it depends on where it's from. Yeah. Well, I non, mean, but in the agencies, they just go with the government. The agencies, well, yeah, they, they will not do that. Yeah, right, right. But the outside organizations, they, they, they may know, know. Yeah. I keep a folder that says budget asks, which is evaluate the disproportionality and ask from governors agencies versus other agencies we don't get additional asks from um, well, i mean we have from within the agencies no no i mean but we the total in terms of the total rate of increase of budgets for agencies supervised by the governor versus the total rate of increase Oh, <laughs> that's lovely. Zero win on it. <laughs> that is beautiful. Hard to follow that up. <laughs> I think that might have come from an agency. <laughs> no, <laughs> tax department. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they don't need to send flowers. They did a good job. <laughs> but I mean, I think the. Um, I'm, I'm just struck. Some people are able to talk about the condition and the needs, and some people don't have that discretion and are coming in asking for bigger increases. And I just wondered if the system just seems, uh, I, I think we have to be aware that there's an internal inherent bias in the way we've structured the presentation. And um, we just have to be aware of that. And, and, and we have that. added, we've gone back and added, um, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. uh, Trevor, we did something with the Defender General that wasn't in the original budget, didn't we? It was either it was an IT or something, and then another year we did some people at DEC. Well, I would put all of those groups outside of this conversation. Too, yeah, that's, that's true. Great that's a good point. And it's also not even state agencies. It's independent groups that come in and petition. That's the separate the file. Yeah, that yeah. budget asks. Yeah. yeah, they don't get this letter. Yeah. Okay. Continues. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Um, so the next section is the Vantage Budget System Reports. So these are the reports that provide a lot of detailed information about the respective agency and department budgets. It's run from the administration's budgeting system, which is called Vantage right now, this current iteration. Um, agencies and departments typically do send um, these reports when they send over the balance of their testimony materials. Um, Aaron uploads them to your website. We also have them on the Joint Fiscal Office website. It's where you're going to find like line item detail in terms of like operating expenses, like what's the actual proposed amount being spent in a particular line item. It gives a historical trend. It lists position by position. There's all sorts of really detailed information. It may be some of you are familiar with them. Representative Shai, I think you um, had some questions about um, the Cannabis Control Board maybe earlier this week um, because they did provide their materials. Right. I was just doing a quick sampling of our website and I, I think we may be missing a few of these reports. So, which isn't atypical because the departments and agencies are really focusing on getting their ups and downs document, the presentation materials, everything in order for the committee. The Vantage, it's a system that they just have to run the reports and send over the PDF, but that those are things that Aaron and Maria will follow up to make sure that we get them. But it gives you a really a deeper dive into the, the nitty gritty of their budgets, if you will. It's one of the items that we've talked about, maybe having someone from finance and management come and walk you through it. Um, but I encourage you to, you know, maybe dip your toe in and see what information is there. I, I have been known from time to time, if I'm looking, um, for a particular line item within a department, sometimes you can find that information in the Vantage system reports. So, yeah, great. Um, the next item is the crosswalk spreadsheet, the ups and downs. I think by now that's probably getting more and more familiar to newer members of the committee and, um, and that that's typically what we are walking through when we try to evaluate a submission. You know, one suggestion it's very specific. It would be really great if they could put the B number on their crosswalk, and most of them don't. Um, so it would be really good if you could tell them in the future. Well, the dark green, is sometimes it's in that dark sometimes, green. Sometimes, but yeah. more often than not, it's not. Yeah, and I think we do note that on here. It says to please write in that section numbers corresponding with the budget should be included on the far left of each crosswalk. Uh, so I think it is 
Um, an important note that maybe we can try to stress with the administration. And I know our my colleague yeah, in finance and management is listening. And so um, he just acknowledged. So and the other one is page numbers that we can read. Yeah. I've maybe, maybe had two or three presentations where there have actually been page numbers that I can see. Otherwise. Yeah. No, oh, good notes. Because without the section number, it is hard to find. And without the page numbers, it's hard to find. So important notes. Um, Okay, the, the next item is federal funding. So we ask agencies and departments to identify federal funding sources that are likely to be reduced or eliminated in the coming fiscal year based on the information that they have at the time. Um, we also, if there's any other significant changes that are occurring to their federal funds, um, we do ask them to highlight that for us. Um, I know at the Agency of Human Services, they do as you as you evaluate their budget proposals there's a lot of changes to federal funding and so they do um identify that for the committee for our awareness <clears throat> an item I'm, i've moved on to the next page speaking of no page numbers <laughs> and the second paragraph on that page um this is a, a new section this year where we've asked for agencies and departments um, to let us know if, um, if their budget proposal in includes any significant funding from any of their recent federal bills. So that could include the American Rescue Plan Act, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, et cetera. And so I think you have seen some of those items um, flow through in some of the pre presentations that we have received. I expect when we get the details, for example, in the Agency of Natural Resources, the Agency of Transportation, we'll see more of those items highlighted for us. The next item is a particular flavor of federal funds, which is the federal state fiscal recovery funds. Um, a lot of agencies and departments are carrying out right now programs that were essentially fully appropriated last session using American Rescue Plan out state fiscal recovery fund dollars. And so we are asking for them to be prepared to provide an update to this committee um, on the status of those programs. I think we've had some conversations about the need to understand the status of these programs, but I don't I don't know that we've actually had the opportunity yet to dig into some of those programs. So this may be a conversation once we get through the initial testimonies um, to take uh, maybe working with the Secretary of Administration's office to try to understand the status of some of these programs. We do work um, with finance and management who provides updated like how much has been spent from this fund source, which gives you a view into it. Um, I think we've had, I've presented some testimony to this committee on that, but it's it's not, it's more complex than just looking at an expenditure report from the accounting system. So that's a note for more conversation to come. The next item is labeled impact on Vermonters, the policy impact assessment. The policy impact assessment is actually, I think, a relatively new tool that the administration is using to help evaluate new initiatives, if you will. Um, it is a form, it's a pretty, I think it's like maybe an eight page form that agencies and departments are asked to fill out for the, for the governor's budget process to uh, answer a series of questions about any new initiatives or changes that will be included in the budget request. And so we've asked for agencies and departments to provide us with policy impact assessments to the, to the extent that they filled them out. To my knowledge, and I haven't looked closely at this yet, I'm not sure if we've received any of these yet. Um, and so that may be um, an area of further follow-up. It's just gonna give you some more detail about new initiatives, new proposals to help you understand what's being proposed. And so I don't, I don't know if you recall seeing any of those yet this year, but I think that's an area that we can follow up. And the next item, um, we asked them to identify any um, changes to positions and vacancy savings. I think that's been a common theme as you review department's budgets to understand the impact of higher levels of vacancy savings, because it does seem pretty consistently through the budget adjustment. And now again, in the 24, that you're seeing higher levels of vacancy savings and trying to understand what's the impact of that on program delivery. So that's the piece we're not getting. We're getting the dollars, but we aren't hearing what the impact is of the vacancy savings. So it gets back to what Rep. Dolan was saying with, you know, what, what are we getting to do that's yeah. not happening? So is the, do they have any sort of a 
think, and they don't probably don't have a form about that kind of impact. So it would be up to us to ask the question. Yeah. Yeah, and I think as you meet with your agencies and departments, making sure to have those conversations to understand the impact will be critical. By the way, where is the Vantage report on your website? Um, it would be um, if you went to appropriation, there's going to be an Vantage report for each agency and department's for budget. Agency. Yep. It's not, there isn't one report on your website. Correct. Correct. Um, so it's under the agency. Nope, you would go to the joint fiscal. There's a couple of places that you can go to get that information. Um, as Erin receives the Vantage reports, she's going to post them on the House Appropriations website underneath okay. whatever the department I, is. I've seen those. Yeah, okay. yep. The the other thing I couldn't I could know I don't. There's something called the Big Budget Book, which is one of the. It's you know really a three inch 15, book. A fifteen. Exactly. Page, right? Yeah. That has some additional details but not quite as many details as the Vantage report. So it's just another resource to want. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, another question, again, I keep coming back to the vacancy savings, but when I, I looked at the instructions for the agencies in creating their, their budgets and proposing their budgets for the governor's budget, um, I think it was sent out last August or mm -hmm. September timeframe, when you have a, a cost of living increase, including salary steps, perhaps, but you're you are required to maintain, unless you can advocate otherwise, to maintain a a a, a, a um, only a three percent growth, for example, to cover some of that mm -hmm. cost of living increase. The way it appears that agencies are trying to make up that difference is through vacancy savings. So it may be certainly a function of not being able to find the right employees or the, the, the posting may be uh, at a lower level than where, when they can, can attract the right people. But it could also be, so this is something that I think uh, Representative Holcomb had kind of mentioned, the why is missing, you know? Um, why are the vacancy savings so high? And to tease that up, instead of one general question, um, response of being a, um, a, a, it's because of our unemployment rates being so low, generally speaking, uh, that could be really a partial answer as to why we're relying more and more on vacancy savings. So I, I just I just want to flag that again in terms of trying to understand the why. Mm -hmm. It could also be that they can't meet their statutory obligations. I mean we I know we did that <laughs> you know because we had to use the vacancy savings mm -hmm. statutory obligations. And so that's that's something we should know about but that's not visible in this thing. And the other question I have is we talk about grants but we're also not talking about contracts and it feels like we 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 may be shrinking government, but it's not clear we're shrinking the cost of government. We just may be outsourcing it. And I'm just not beyond the impact on pension obligations. I'm not clear what the implications of that are for, for services and cost of services and efficiency. And I, unless we're also listing the main contracts, I'm not sure we know what's going on. But if I may continue, yeah, I, just to follow up, I think there's um, kind of a, a to double, you know, a couple of things happening at the same time. Um, one is again when when we've frozen fees for many many years, and then uh, and yet still putting such pressure on the vacancy savings as a means of trying to meet uh, the agency's uh, budget expectations. The, the the two things are working, I think. Um, to getting to the, the um, if, uh, having an impact impact on the outcomes we're seeking. Yeah, I think to your your the points that you're making, understanding vacancy savings is complicated because I don't. I think some of what we're seeing now, like for example, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Some of what we're seeing now, and we've heard testimony, is that the, the challenges that they have actually recruiting workforce. So it's not increasing vacancy savings to try to meet a budgetary target. It's it's workforce related. Um, however, I, I think historically, and I can't speak to any other departments like 
vacancy savings in the 24 budget if they're increasing it to try to meet a budgetary target or if they're increasing it because it's what they're actually anticipating to experience. I think understanding when it is because of a budget target versus um, what they're experiencing due to workforce challenges. I think the point about grants and contracts is also a good one because we do, um, and one of the reports in the Vantage system is a detailed listing of the types of grants. Um, the Agency of Human Services also has to provide a detailed grant inventory. So every grant that they issue in a given fiscal year, but we don't ask for the same on the contract contracting side of things. And it really is like, in a lot of ways, grants and contracts are very, very similar. Um, and so understanding that uh, is important. Yeah, and the final point I wanna make on this is that for the time being anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I reserve my right, um, is the impact it has on customer service. And we hear anecdotally the impacts, whether it's trying to get a permit for your wastewater treatment plant or whatever the, the you know the permit is, the delay of five months in a you know in a um, today's economy where we fundamentally need to have more housing and and um, you know the, the infrastructure to support more housing. And those delays on customer service are having a real impact on Vermonters and businesses. So I, I just wanted to kind of mention the the implications or impacts of, of um, these. One situations. last comment on okay. this, and then we're going to move on. <laughs> I, and I just I really I was really uncomfortable with the tax conversation, not because they didn't do a good job. They did a great job with recruitment, but recruitment is not easy in some agencies, and it's not because they aren't trying and because they're normatively doing a bad job. So I just I just have to say that because I feel like we are rewarding people who have easier situations and we're not maybe looking hard enough at why some agencies are really struggling. And it's, it, it's not that they aren't trying all the same things with incentives and improving the work environment. They may just have structural issues. Not there can problem. be lots of different yeah. issues. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, I think so we've talked about grants um, and they have to provide a list, a summary of grants distributed to community and nonprofit organizations. Carry forward funds, this committee, we've had a lot of conversations in the context of budget adjustment. They're supposed to, for each appropriation, provide a summary of the amount of carry forward funds that were available at the end of FY22 and the anticipated amount of carry forward funds available at the end of FY23. And so I think that this is an item that we don't necessarily receive all the details from each of the agencies and departments. But as you know, from having just process and passed the budget adjustment, it, it's sometimes really critical to understanding um, understanding where carry forward is and why, and then how it gets used. Single audit findings. So we ask agencies and departments to let us know um, when there are repeat findings related to the single audit. So this typically, um, this typically can signal to you if there is a structural issue within an agency and department, is there a reason why they continue to have the same finding as part of the single audit? And so I, I don't know if you've heard any uh, of any repeat findings this year in testimony that you've received. I will tell you um, the joint fiscal committee does take, we get, get an update from the auditor I think it's in September or November where he provides his kind of assessment of the single audit in some areas of concern. Um, and one of the things I highlighted this year is workforce issues. Um, not only I think what you've been hearing about as it relates to delivering programs, but also within um, the, the financial offices, the agencies and departments and their ability to uh, keep up with the audits and corrective action plans and those types of things. So it is an important area and can be an indicator of programs that are under stress. <clears throat> and then we have the last thing on this page is the human services specific request where we ask for longitudinal data about the populations and the services that they um, receive from the programs within the Agency of Human Services. And so that could include things like caseload trends, um, the characteristics of the populations they're serving, acuity of need. And I think you'll, as we 
you received some testimony last week from the Agency of Human Services. You saw varying degrees of that information. I'm not sure how much you got to dive into some of those slides because the, the testimony is just to get through the ups and downs. I think for DCF was three hours and you, you've got a little bit of that data, but not, but not a lot. So my concern, the way this is phrased, is we talk longitudinal, but then we say recent. Slow and longitudinal and recent aren't the same thing. And what I'm finding is that we're getting a lot of five-year trends, which are absolutely meaningless, because that's three years of the pandemic plus where we are now. And it doesn't, it doesn't help us. We need to go back farther. So when you meet with your folks, you can ask them. Yeah. Okay, and I think that's really it. The last page is um, questions and to reach out to the Joint Fiscal Office staff. Um, do you ever get any questions? We do. We usually we get asked, when are we getting this? Okay. So people like people really do use it. Um, and, and we do get some questions. So yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Is there more that you're supposed to talk to us about? The only thing that I'll maybe highlight to you um, as the chair was reflecting, and it's it's on your website. Yesterday, Maria sent out to all of the subject matter committees um, a request, a memo from this committee, from the chair, requesting their feedback on the FY24 budget. And so as you look, um, and maybe for ease, if you're on the House Appropriations website and you go to yesterday's date, um, I think you will find all of the letters that were sent out to each of the committees. And so there's a cover memo that, that requests their feedback on right. budget proposals by mm -hmm. March 1st. And then we include links to the entire budget. So both like the executive summary, um, the language, and the web report. But then something new that we uh, have done this year, um, working with our colleagues and ledge council to um, maybe try to be a little bit more direct in terms of the feedback that we're looking for from the subject matter committees, we created tables for each of the committees. And so if you were to click in, um, let me see you were to click into like house agriculture, we're trying to like set a template, set the framework for how we wanna receive the feedback for them and give them some more specific details about what we're asking for. So it starts, the first section is looking for other feedback. So if they have items to add that are either not included in the governor recommend um, or you know something that they wanna provide more details on, that's the first thing that they can do. And then the template goes through um, kind of section by section, it starts with like the number section, so the B sections where all the dollar changes are. To the extent, um, depending on what agency or department it was, whether we had the details behind their changes, um, we did provide that information to the subject matter committees. Um, so for example, uh, human services, healthcare, we have the details from the Agency of Human Services. And so we tried to highlight for those committees some of the more significant, if you will, policy changes so that they could really hone in on that and not um, give them enough detail so they could to focus their attention, but also not wanting to prohibit them from thinking more broadly. So we detailed the dollars, the B section changes. We listed any relevant one-time appropriations, which this year are significant. As you know, the governor is proposing roughly 270 million of one-time appropriations. So there's a lot of policy, if you will, being proposed in those appropriations. And then we have a section on language. So if there's any language relative to that committee, asking them to look at it. And so- And this, this isn't really, I'm looking at the ag one and it's interesting. So for example, they have, the tax department, because it's the digitization of current digitization of current use, which is an ag related thing, uh, which isn't, I mean, I think they support the current use program. I can't imagine that this is directly related, but it's indirectly. And so it's nice. This is a lot of work to put this together. This is very impressive. Thank you. Really helpful. It was a, it was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's going to lead to a good product. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And now that you've done it once, maybe, I mean, every budget year will be different, but at least the concept is yeah. there. Yeah. So. 
kudos. Thank you. Um, I think I saw Mark Mahali in there. Yeah, thank you. I just printed mine out for agriculture, I mean, for uh, I read. Um, and Ed, do you have any, this is a lot of work on their part. Do you have any sense as to whether they're going to do any of this? Have you, have they talked to you? So they, they, they have not talked to us specifically yet, the committees themselves, but they will do the work similar to what they did in budget adjustment. They will do the work and it's, I think it's meaningful. It's meaningful to them. It's meaningful to this committee and it's, it's a lot of work, but it's important. I agree. It's My, important. Yeah. 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 But they, they will. And that's why, so we try to stress if you are supportive of a proposal, you don't have to do anything. You can just leave it blank. It's like, let us know if you think something should be adjusted or if you don't support something. So we're trying to reduce the work for, burden on them, but um, you know. <laughs> and I'll just, I'll, I'll point out too that it isn't just, I think as a body, we don't need to just react to this. We need to think about Okay, that's great. What do what do we want to do with this? Is now our budget to write. What do we want to do, and or so it's sort of like what is what is going to be our rewrite, and maybe some of this will come over, you know, as pieces come in, instead of like we want to do this and then try to break in. I try to my mindset is like this is what we want to do, and there might be parts of this that will come over. Right? Does that make sense? And Thank you. Just a couple of comments. One is not only do I like this, I also appreciate adding priority there for that very reason yes. that we may not be able to support everything, but what, we, what do we want to hear in terms of the policy committee's priorities? Uh, I just also wanted to just mention regarding this uh, January 26th letter. Thank you for this. I mean, because it was easy for us to kind of identify some of our frustrations when we get this information that it's not the complete story. Yeah. But I truly wanted to make sure you will realize how appreciative we are of this work. So, mm -hmm. yes. thank you. And next year, it might actually result in a more uniform approach to the reporting that we get. <clears throat> and, and as we ask the questions that we're saying we want the information to, whether it's right. in this forum or when we meet with our budget portfolio people, right. you know, Chris, as Tristan said, we're responsible for making sure we ask the questions. Right. right. And because we're just having it on our website going, oh, yeah, the agency's letters are up, is, I felt it was important to have the walkthrough of like, this is what's going on. That it isn't just it is just on our page, but yeah. in the future you'll be a little more in, not in tune to it, but understand when we say that. Oh, I need I should probably go get that and we see what my budget area is hearing, and it's funny because we had to negotiate not negotiate, but it was a letter that's coming from both the Senate and the House, so the Senate required you know myself um, several drafts before it was. Um, comfortable for both. And because the House and the Senate don't always approach the conversation the same way. Uh, so uh, working with JFO to get just the right balance between, you know, how we dig in for, and, and seek at the level we do of our, our standing committees um, versus, um, mm -hmm. but we, can, we got there. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, yeah. huge, yeah. huge, very helpful. Yeah. Good, good. So we got through the letter. We got through. <coughs> yeah. So I checked off. So anything else? Well, we there's not. Yeah, yeah, there's coming up would be cash fund and the um, oh, good. oh, the and the language we have it. You know, the other language, which will that we we keep, we'll keep having you back. Thank you. Sounds good. And I have to just say, I, I think I said it, but Maria really drove yes. like getting these tables and like pouring through the language and the budget. Right. And um, <laughs> there might be some cases where some things were left out or we added things that shouldn't have been added. So it's a little fluid. Sure, it's okay. Right. We're over. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both. 11 o'clock. So is it break?
Yeah, great. And the press release is out for our public hearing. Oh, perfect. It just came in your inbox. Public hearing. So we are waiting till 1130, and then we have the. Um, tonight. Tonight. We have to be in 1130. 